I am the Space Quest Historian. In this series, we're delving into all the ways the Space Quest series have messed with our heads, either through sequences that required inhuman levels of clairvoyance, or just from being snarky little dickbags. Today's subject is Space Quest II Volhall's Revenge from 1987, a game that, much like its predecessor, seems to take a special degree of gleeful delight in watching the players squirm and struggle in abject frustration. But before we crack on with the juicy mayhem of frustration, I have a small but embarrassing confession to make. In my previous video about dick moves in Space Quest 1, I teased this episode on Space Quest 2 by promising you that you only had to go two screens into the game before you could irrevocably softlock yourself. And it was pointed out to me that that's not quite true. Or at least it's true, but only if you intend on going for some sort of full completion playthrough. So uh, allow me to explain. The softlock I was referring to was if you forgot to look inside these lockers on the wall of the airlock chamber on Xenon Orbital Station 4 where the game starts. Roger's locker here contains a jockstrap and a Rubik's Cube, two items that, as you may have guessed, are needed to solve certain puzzles later in the game, but are irretrievable once you leave the station. The only problem is, I forgot that there are actually multiple solutions to the two puzzles where these items are needed. The Cubics Rube, as it has been renamed in a snarky attempt at subverting copyright infringement, can be used to distract this Labion terror beast. He shows up about two thirds of the way through the game, and the solution is to just chuck the cubic puzzle at him, thereby confusing him for long enough to slip past him and onto the next screen. The thing is though, you don't actually have to chuck the puzzle at him, you can just simply leave the screen and come back and that little twirly fuck stick will be gone. Granted, this doesn't give you the points awarded for solving it in the quote unquote correct way, but indeed, a soft lock it is not. The other item, the jockstrap, is used on the screen immediately following the Terror Beast's little meadow. Here, an enemy guard is patrolling the catwalk of this shuttle landing pad, and you can use the jockstrap to chuck a rock at his face, sending him plummeting to the ground like, quote, a lead parakeet, which is one of my favorite lines from the game. If you miss your window, Roger still chucks the rock, which doesn't kill the guard, but instead prompts him to take the elevator down to investigate, allowing you to skillfully Metal Gear Solid your way past him and take said elevator back up to the shuttle. But again, using the jockstrap for this endeavor is entirely optional. Instead of using the jockstrap to fling the rock, you can just fling the rock. I mean, with your hands. This leads to the same game of cat and monkey as before, and the only difference is, again, just how many points you are awarded for your ingenuity. So technically, failing to pick up these two items on the orbital station does not constitute soft locks. I have misled you, and I apologize. But getting back to that adorable little twirly fuckstick, the Labion Terror Beast, getting him to actually show up requires you to blow the infamous Labion Terror Beast mating whistle, and procuring that item does introduce a potential soft lock. You start out the game with an order form for this exact whistle, which you're meant to put into this mailbox that's inexplicably sitting around in the jungle on the planet you crash land on early in the game. Granted, you would have to be exceptionally unobservant to miss this thing, and it is pretty obvious what you're supposed to do with it when you look at it. But failing to obtain said whistle is indeed a soft lock, because once you reach the Terra Beast's cozy little picnic spot here, much, much later in the game, you are doomed to spend the rest of eternity walking back and forth between this paddling pool and this short board for some reason still impenetrable slab of rock. There is no way to go back and get the whistle once you're here. And indeed, failing to pick up important objects and soft locking yourself is a specialty that Space Quest 2 delights in. Frankly, this game should have just been called Space Quest 2 Soft Locks Revenge. Another case in point are these paralyzing spores you encounter early on, which are an essential item. Later in the game, Roger's captured by this weird hunter beast with a cheeky smile and an affinity for spit roast barbecues. Tossing a spore at his feet will knock him out just long enough for you to grab the key to the cage and skedaddle before he comes back to his senses. But the spores themselves are not quite as obvious as the whole business with the mailbox and the mating whistle. In fact, they're quite the devious little fuckers. In your first encounter with them, you might accidentally knock one of them over, releasing the paralyzing cloud of spores and dropping to the jungle floor incapacitated. Roger will eventually get back up again, but the paralysis lasts for so long, you'd be forgiven for thinking this was a death and they just forgot to put in a game over screen. In a jungle full of carnivorous mushrooms, barely concealed pitfalls, and hungry root monsters, the spores just seem like another environmental hazard you're meant to avoid. Picking one up seems like the last thing you should be doing, given that just gently nudging one will instantly send you immovable and drooling on whatever surface you were standing on. But 
that's what you're supposed to do. And of course, once you find yourself locked up in the hunter's cage, waiting to be unceremoniously impaled ass first onto a stick and slow roasted to a delicious golden brown snack, it is way too late to go back and get them. But of course, no discussion of dick moves in Space Quest 2 would be complete without mentioning the goddamn glowing gem. I think it's safe to say that out of all the ways this game, or indeed the entire Space Quest series, could possibly roundhouse kick your sense of enjoyment into the ground, the glowing gem is by far the most pulverizing one. And I don't mean just the fact that you have to somehow work out that there's an underwater cave in the swamp in this particular spot, or that you will inevitably drown unless you remember to take a deep breath before diving in. No, this thing is just a massive soft lock. If you don't dip under the swamp and retrieve it, and then progress far enough in the game to the point where you actually need to use it, it is way too late to go back and get it. But that's not even the worst of it, not by far. No, the real spine-ripping fatality move is when you've already used the stupid thing once to light your way through this cave and then tumble into the valley below. If you avoided another soft lock early in the game by remembering to untie this little diminutive cuddle buddy from a tree, his buddies will show up here and send you on your way to the next part of the game by shoving you into these pitch black underground tunnels. So, time for some more glowing gem action, right? Well, unless you were paying extra close attention a few screens ago, this is around the time you'll be going, hey, what the fuck happened to my gem? Because guess what? That thing fell out of your fucking pocket when you tumbled out into the valley a few moments ago. And the game doesn't tell you this. It just expects you to identify this green pixel on the green grass surface as the gem. If you don't pick it up before these little assholes shove you into the tunnels, you're dead meat because, oh, they just, they forgot to mention there's a killer cave squid roaming the tunnels. And of course that fucking thing is hungry. And of course these little dickweeds won't let you back out of the tunnels once you're in here, so whoop de doo and of course, forgetting to untie the little fucker in the first place just means that his buddies show up in the valley to pelt you with fucking rocks. Another soft lock. Thank you very much. Now we could stop the video right here because frankly, this whole business with the glowing gem falling out of your pocket is my pick for Space Quest II's biggest dick move. In fact, it might be the biggest dick move of the entire series. But before we go, we have to give special mention, of course, to the kissy alien aboard Vohal's asteroid. On the lower levels of the fortress, there is a prison cell that opens up to reveal a not at all suspicious looking copyright infringement who charges at you. If it catches up with you, it proceeds to give you a big ol' smooch on the lips. And then, bizarrely, the game just continues on as normal. But at this point, you have every reason to assume that all is not well, and you'd be goddamn right. Because later in the game, in fact, right at the very end, just moments before you're about to jet off in an escape pod, this happens. And no, it's not on a timer, no, no, no. The game lets you take your sweet time exploring every nook and cranny of the fortress and get all the way up to Vohal's sanctuary and defeat him. And then, just as the whole place is about to tailspin into a fiery demise in the atmosphere of the planet it's orbiting and you're scrambling like crazy to reach an escape pod before it takes you with it, that's when it chooses to unleash this little punishment on you. Thanks a lot. But there are actually ways to cheese this whole business with the kissy alien, which I'll cover in a separate video, so stay tuned for that. And also for my rundown of dick moves in the next game of the series, Space Quest 3. Now, actually, Space Quest 3 is surprisingly bereft of outright dick moves, and the ones it does have are so outlandishly unlikely to befall the player, it's frankly absurd that they're even in the game at all, so until then, I'll see you around the Chrono Stream. Oh, bye. Oh.